It was a drizzly evening when I first noticed the subtle signs that something was wrong. My wife, Eliza, had been acting strange for weeks, texting late at night, smiling at her phone like it held some private joke. I chalked it up to stress or maybe some harmless distraction, but a nagging feeling in my gut told me otherwise. I'd catch her in moments of quiet, her eyes distant, her mind somewhere else entirely that I should have ignored it, let it go. But the thought of her slipping away from me gnawed at my sanity. So, one night when she left her phone on the kitchen counter, I took a peek. What I found changed everything, the messages were from a man named Greg. They were flirtatious at first, but as I scrolled, they became more intimate, more, damning. My heart pounded in my chest as I read through their exchanges. The image of Eliza, my Eliza, tangled up in some sordid affair with this stranger made my blood run cold but that wasn't the worst of it that as I dug deeper, I discovered something that froze the blood in my veins. Greg was married too, to a woman named Rachel. My mind spun as I pieced it all together. The idea of confronting Eliza or Greg about the affair seemed too predictable, too mundane. A darker thought began to take root, something more sinister, what if I turned the tables? What if I got close to Rachel, I found her easily enough, social media makes it all too simple these days. Rachel was stunning, with a softness that contrasted sharply with Eliza's sharp edges. She was kind, caring, the kind of woman who posted about charity work and family gatherings. It didn't take much to arrange a meeting. A chance encounter at a local coffee shop was all it took, Rachel was lonely. She talked about Greg, how distant he'd become, how she feared he was hiding something. I feigned sympathy, all while feeling a sick thrill at how easily the pieces were falling into place. The guilt gnawed at me, but the desire for revenge was stronger and so, our relationship began. At first, it was just drinks, coffee, and walks in the park. But soon, it became more. Rachel was everything Eliza wasn't, sweet, vulnerable, trusting. She fell for me quickly, and I pretended to fall for her. But in reality, I was spinning a web, playing both sides until the time was right, the first few weeks of my double life were exhilarating. I'd spend the day with Rachel, listening to her talk about her life, her fears, and her dreams. By night, I'd go home to Eliza, pretending nothing had changed, all the while knowing I held the power to shatter her world but as the days wore on, something changed. The thrill of the game started to wear off, replaced by a growing sense of dread. Rachel was falling deeper, and I was the one pulling her under. There were nights I'd lie awake, wondering how far I could push this, how long I could keep up the charade before everything crumbled, then, one night, Rachel told me something that sent a chill down my spine. She was planning to confront Greg about the affair. She wanted me there for support, said she couldn't do it alone, the moment of truth was fast approaching, and I knew there would be no turning back, the night Rachel planned to confront Greg arrived sooner than I was ready for. My mind raced as I sat in my car, parked a block away from their house, staring at the darkened windows. I'd been playing this game for weeks, feeling like a puppeteer pulling strings from the shadows. But now, the weight of it all was pressing down on me, suffocating that I watched Rachel's silhouette moving inside, pacing back and forth, clutching her phone like a lifeline. She had texted me earlier, asking me to come in when the time was right. The idea of walking into that house, facing Greg, and watching the explosion unfold was enough to make my skin crawl. But I had started this, and there was no backing out now, after what felt like an eternity, I saw Greg's car pull into the driveway. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched him get out, unaware of the storm waiting for him inside. He was tall, athletic, the kind of man who seemed to have everything going for him. It made me hate him even more, Greg disappeared into the house, and I sat there, frozen in place, waiting for Rachel's signal. Minutes ticked by, and then my phone buzzed. It was a simple message, now that I took a deep breath and got out of the car, forcing myself to walk up the path to their front door. My hand shook as I knocked, the sound echoing in the quiet night. For a moment, I hoped no one would answer, that maybe I could turn around and leave this all behind. 
But then the door creaked open, and Rachel stood there, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and determination, come in, she whispered, stepping aside to let me enter, the house was eerily quiet as I followed her into the living room. Greg was standing by the fireplace, his expression a mask of confusion and annoyance. He looked at me, then at Rachel, clearly trying to piece together what was happening. Who the hell is this? Greg's voice was sharp, slicing through the tension. This is Jason, Rachel said, her voice trembling. He's, he's been a friend to me, Greg. And he knows, Greg's eyes narrowed as he turned to me. Knows what? The moment hung in the air, thick with the impending chaos. I could feel my heart racing, my mind scrambling for a way out. But Rachel was already too far gone, too wrapped up in the truth she was about to unleash. Knows about the affair, Rachel said, her voice breaking. I know you've been seeing someone else, Greg. I've known for weeks, the silence that followed was suffocating. Greg stared at her, his face slowly contorting into a mask of rage and disbelief. I could see the gears turning in his head as he tried to figure out how this had all come crashing down, you're crazy, Greg finally spat, his voice low and dangerous. You've been listening to this guy. A stranger. You don't even know him, Rachel, but Rachel was shaking her head, tears streaming down her face. It's not just him, Greg. I've seen the texts, the calls. I know it's true, Greg's eyes flicked to me, and in that moment, I saw something dark and sinister in his gaze. He took a step forward, and I instinctively backed away, the walls closing in around me, get out, Greg growled, his voice barely controlled. Get the hell out of my house, Rachel looked at me, her eyes pleading, but I could see the realization dawning on her. I wasn't the savior she had hoped for, I was something far more dangerous. I hesitated, my mind a blur of conflicting thoughts, but then I turned and walked out the door, leaving Rachel and Greg behind that I stumbled back to my car, my hands shaking as I fumbled for the keys. The night air was cool, but I was burning up inside, the adrenaline coursing through my veins. I started the engine and drove off, my mind racing with the reality of what I'd set in motion. As I sped down the darkened streets, a thought crept into my mind, had I pushed Rachel too far? Had I pushed Greg too far? The thought of what might happen between them tonight twisted my stomach into knots, but there was nothing I could do to stop it now that my phone buzzed, and I glanced at it, half expecting another message from Rachel. But it wasn't from her. It was from Eliza, where are you, she asked that I stared at the screen, my mind spiraling into chaos. How much did Eliza know? How much had she guessed? The walls were closing in from all sides, and I realized with a sickening dread that there was no way out. Not now, the game was unraveling, and I was about to lose everything, the drive back home was a blur. My mind was spinning, replaying the confrontation between Greg and Rachel over and over again. I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible was about to happen, something I had set in motion but couldn't control. By the time I pulled into my driveway, I was drenched in sweat, my hands trembling on the steering wheel, Eliza was waiting for me inside, sitting on the couch with a glass of wine in her hand. She didn't even look up when I walked in, just stared at the glass, swirling the deep red liquid slowly, where were you, her voice was eerily calm, and that scared me more than if she had been screaming, out, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Had a meeting that ran late, she finally looked up, her eyes sharp and searching. Don't lie to me, Jason. I know something's going on, my heart sank. What do you mean, Eliza sighed, setting the glass down on the coffee table. I'm not an idiot. You've been distant, sneaking around. I don't know if you're having an affair or what, but something's off, for a moment, I considered telling her everything, spilling the entire twisted truth right there. But the words wouldn't come. Instead, I did what I had been doing for weeks, I lied, I'm not having an affair, I said, forcing myself to meet her gaze. Work has just been, stressful. I'm sorry if I've been distant, Eliza studied me for what felt like an eternity, her expression unreadable. Then she nodded slowly, almost as if she had expected this response, all right, she said quietly. But if there's something you're not telling me, Jason, it's going to come out eventually. 
You know that, right? I nodded, the guilt twisting in my gut. I know, she picked up her wine glass again, signaling the end of the conversation, and I turned to leave, desperate to escape the suffocating tension in the room. But as I walked toward the stairs, she spoke again, her voice stopping me in my tracks, who's Rachel, the question hit me like a punch to the gut. I turned around slowly, trying to keep my face neutral, but my mind was racing. How could she know about Rachel? Had she been following me? Or had Rachel contacted her, Rachel, I repeated, stalling for time, yeah, Eliza said, her eyes narrowing. You got a text from someone named Rachel a couple of days ago. I saw it on your phone, I felt a cold sweat break out on the back of my neck. I had been so careful, or so I thought. But now, everything was unraveling, and I didn't know how to stop it, she's a client, I lied, my voice barely steady. We've been working on a project together. That's all, Eliza didn't respond, just stared at me with those piercing eyes that seemed to see right through me. Finally, she nodded, but I could tell she wasn't convinced. She was only giving me enough rope to hang myself that I turned and fled upstairs, my heart pounding in my chest. I locked the bedroom door behind me and collapsed onto the bed, my mind spinning out of control. How much longer could I keep this up? How much longer before everything came crashing down around me, I reached for my phone, needing to do something, anything, to feel like I still had some control. There were no new messages from Rachel, but there was one from an unknown number. My heart skipped a beat as I opened it, my breath catching in my throat you've started something you can't finish the message was short, but it sent a chill down my spine. I stared at it, trying to make sense of it. Who had sent it? Greg? Or was it Rachel? Or maybe someone else entirely, someone who knew more than they should, I quickly typed back, who is this, but no response came. I sat there, staring at the screen, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But the only answer was the oppressive silence of the night, closing in on me from all sides, hours passed before I finally fell into a restless sleep, haunted by images of Rachel's tear-streaked face, Greg's cold eyes, and Eliza's knowing stare. The web I had spun was tightening around me, and there was no escape, the next morning, I woke to the sound of my phone buzzing on the nightstand. Groggily, I reached for it, squinting at the screen. It was Rachel, I need to see you, her message read that I hesitated, my heart pounding in my chest. I wanted to ignore it, to pretend that none of this was happening. But I knew that was impossible. I had gone too far, and now I had to face the consequences, where, I texted back, my fingers shaking, same place as before. Noon, I glanced at the clock. It was 10.30 a.m. Eliza was already up and moving around downstairs, her footsteps echoing through the house. I knew I needed to go, but the thought of facing Rachel after everything that had happened filled me with dread, still, I couldn't avoid her forever. I got dressed, my mind racing with all the things that could go wrong. What if Greg had done something to her? What if she had figured out my game? What if, Jason, Eliza's voice cut through my thoughts, and I jumped, turning to see her standing in the doorway. She looked at me, her expression unreadable, I'm heading out for a bit, I said quickly, trying to keep my voice casual, she nodded slowly, her eyes lingering on me for a moment longer than usual. All right. Be careful, I swallowed hard, forcing a smile. I will, as I walked past her, I could feel her eyes on me, watching, waiting. I knew she suspected something, but I couldn't deal with that right now. There was too much at stake that I got in the car and drove to the location Rachel had mentioned. It was a secluded park, one we had met at before, where the trees provided enough cover to keep prying eyes away. When I arrived, Rachel was already there, sitting on a bench, her face pale and drawn, she looked up as I approached, and I saw the fear in her eyes, Rachel, what happened, I asked, trying to keep the panic out of my voice, she looked around nervously before speaking, her voice barely above a whisper. Greg knows, Jason. He knows everything, my blood ran cold. What do you mean, everything, he, he found out about us, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. He confronted me last night, after you left. 
He was, furious. I've never seen him like that before, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. Did he, hurt you? Rachel shook her head, but the fear in her eyes told me there was more to the story. No, but he said things, Jason. Terrible things. He said he's going to make us pay for what we've done, I felt like the ground was shifting beneath me. This was spiraling out of control faster than I could handle, what did he say, Rachel, I asked, my voice trembling, she hesitated, then reached into her bag and pulled out a small, crumpled piece of paper. She handed it to me, her hands shaking that I unfolded it and felt my heart stop, scrawled in thick, jagged letters were the words, you can't hide from the truth. It will destroy you, the same message, almost word for word, as the text I had received, panic gripped me as I stared at the note, my mind racing. Who else knew? How far would Greg go to keep this secret buried, Rachel was crying now, her hands covering her face. Jason, what are we going to do? I'm scared. I don't know what he's capable of, I didn't have an answer. The walls were closing in from all sides, and the game I had started was slipping out of my control. There was no way to back out now, no way to fix the damage I had done but one thing was clear, Greg was out for blood, and he wasn't going to stop until he got his revenge. Rachel's tears turned into quiet sobs, each one pulling me deeper into the abyss of guilt and fear. I wanted to comfort her, to tell her that everything would be alright, but the words caught in my throat. I was the one who had dragged her into this nightmare, and now we were both trapped, with no clear way out, the note crumpled in my hand as I tried to think of something, anything, that could salvage the situation. But my mind was a whirlwind of dread. Greg knew about us, and he was clearly unhinged. The question now wasn't if he would strike, but when we need to go to the police, Rachel whispered, breaking the heavy silence, her suggestion sent a fresh wave of panic through me. The police? How could we possibly explain this twisted mess without implicating ourselves? Without revealing my own monstrous deception, no, I said, shaking my head. We can't do that, Rachel. There's too much at stake. If we go to the police, it'll all come out, the affair, everything. We'll be ruined, she looked at me, eyes wide with fear. So what do we do? Just wait for Greg to come after us. I can't live like this, Jason. I'm scared of him. He's not the man I thought I married, I swallowed hard, my thoughts racing. We'll figure something out. Maybe we can talk to him, make him understand, understand, Rachel's voice was incredulous, almost hysterical. Jason, he's not going to listen to us. He's gone off the deep end. You didn't see him last night. He's dangerous, the desperation in her voice made my skin crawl. I was running out of options, and fast. Every instinct told me to run, to leave this all behind before it got worse, but there was no escaping the web I'd woven. Not now, Rachel, listen to me, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. You need to leave town for a few days. Go stay with family, friends, anywhere but here. Just until things cool down. I'll talk to Greg, try to reason with him. Maybe I can get him to see that this doesn't have to go any further, she stared at me, her eyes searching mine for any hint of a solution. But all she found was the desperation of a man who had lost control of his own life, I don't have anywhere to go, she said quietly. My family lives out of state. I can't just pick up and leave without raising questions, I clenched my fists, feeling the walls closing in once more. Then stay with me. At least for a couple of nights. We'll figure out the next step from there, Rachel hesitated, fear and uncertainty etched on her face. But finally, she nodded, as if realizing that there was no other option. Okay. I'll pack a bag as she walked back to her car, I felt a sickening dread settle in the pit of my stomach. This wasn't a solution. It was a temporary reprieve, a brief delay before the inevitable collapse. But I had no other plan, and no time to come up with one that we drove back to my house in tense silence, the air thick with unspoken fears. When we arrived, I led Rachel inside, my mind racing with a thousand thoughts. Eliza's car wasn't in the driveway, which meant she was still out, 
likely at work or running errands. I was relieved, but the feeling was fleeting. It wouldn't be long before she came home, and I had no idea how I was going to explain Rachel's presence that I set Rachel up in the guest room, trying to ignore the overwhelming sense of wrongness that filled the house. She sat on the edge of the bed, looking small and lost, like a child caught in a nightmare, try to get some rest, I said, forcing a smile. We'll talk more in the morning Rachel nodded absently, but I could tell she wasn't really listening. Her mind was somewhere else, reliving the horrors of the night before that I left her alone and headed downstairs, trying to steady my nerves. The house was quiet, too quiet, and every creak of the floorboard sent a jolt of paranoia through me. I poured myself a drink, hoping it would calm my frayed nerves, but it did little to soothe the growing sense of dread. As I sat on the couch, staring into the amber liquid, my mind began to wander. What if Greg was watching us right now? What if he knew Rachel was here? The thought made my skin crawl. I got up, double-checking the locks on the doors and windows, but it did little to ease my anxiety, time passed slowly, each minute dragging into an eternity. I kept glancing at the clock, wondering when Eliza would come home, wondering how I would explain everything to her, then, around midnight, I heard it, a faint sound coming from upstairs. At first, I thought it was just the house settling, but as I listened closer, I realized it was something else. Footsteps that am why heart leapt into my throat. The footsteps were soft, almost hesitant, but unmistakable. They were coming from the hallway outside the guest room that I moved quietly, creeping up the stairs, my pulse pounding in my ears. The sound grew louder as I approached the top, each step a reminder that I was plunging deeper into a nightmare of my own making, when I reached the hallway, the sound stopped. I stood there, frozen, staring at the closed door of the guest room. My hand trembled as I reached for the doorknob, every instinct screaming at me to turn and run. But I had to know that I opened the door slowly, the hinges creaking in the silence. The room was dark, the only light coming from the dim glow of the street lamp outside. I squinted, trying to see into the shadows, and then I saw it, Rachel was lying on the bed, her back to me. But something was wrong. Her body was twisted in an unnatural angle, her limbs splayed out in a way that sent a jolt of terror through me, Rachel, I whispered, my voice barely audible, she didn't respond. I stepped closer, my heart pounding in my chest. As I reached the edge of the bed, I saw the truth. Rachel's eyes were wide open, staring lifelessly at the ceiling. Her face was contorted in a grotesque expression of fear, frozen in the final moments of her life. And her throat, her throat was slit, a dark, jagged line that still oozed blood onto the pillow beneath her that I stumbled back, choking on a scream, my mind reeling from the horror in front of me. Rachel was dead. Murdered. In my own home, and then, as if on cue, my phone buzzed in my pocket. My hands shook as I pulled it out, dread filling every inch of me. The screen lit up with a new message from that same unknown number I warned you. Now you're next, my world shattered in that moment. There was no more pretending, no more lies. I had unleashed something dark and uncontrollable, and now it was coming for me that as I stood there, staring at Rachel's lifeless body, I knew there was only one thing left to do that I had to survive, the world spun around me as I stumbled away from Rachel's lifeless body, my vision swimming with panic. I had to think, had to act, but all I could focus on was the blood, so much blood soaking into the sheets, staining everything it touched. The metallic scent filled the room, and with it came the horrifying realization, I was in way over my head, and now I was the one marked for death. My phone buzzed again in my hand, dragging me out of my spiraling thoughts. The same unknown number flashed across the screen, but I couldn't bring myself to open the message. I knew what it would say, another threat, another promise of the violence yet to come. My hands trembled as I shoved the phone into my pocket, my mind racing with possibilities that I needed to get out of the house. Eliza would be home any minute, and I couldn't let her walk into this nightmare. I couldn't let her see what I had done. The thought of her finding Rachel's body, finding me standing over it, drenched in guilt, was too much to bear that I hurried down the stairs, my movements frantic as I grabbed my keys off the counter. I had to get away, 
to put distance between myself and the horror upstairs. But where could I go? Who could I turn to, as I reached the front door, it suddenly swung open, and I froze in place. Eliza stood on the threshold, her eyes widening in surprise as she took in the sight of me, pale and disheveled, keys in hand like I was fleeing the scene, Jason, she asked, her voice laced with confusion and concern. What's going on? You look, I cut her off, my voice shaky. Eliza, we need to leave. Now, she frowned, stepping inside and closing the door behind her. What are you talking about? What's happened, I could see the questions forming in her eyes, the suspicion taking root. But I couldn't tell her the truth, couldn't let her get caught up in the chaos I had created. My mind scrambled for a lie, something to explain away my panic, but all I could think of was the blood, the note, the ticking clock that was my life, Eliza, please, I begged, grabbing her arm. We have to go. I'll explain everything later, but we need to get out of here, she stared at me for a long moment, her eyes searching mine. I could see the doubt in her expression, the fear that I was hiding something from her. And I was, so much that it was tearing me apart, Jason, what are you not telling me, she asked, her voice quiet and steady. What happened, before I could answer, before I could try to lie my way out of it, there was a loud crash from upstairs. The sound echoed through the house, sharp and violent, and Eliza's head whipped around, her eyes going wide with alarm. What was that? She whispered, her voice trembling now then my heart pounded in my chest. Someone was in the house, Greg, it had to be Greg. He was here, and he had just killed Rachel, and now he was coming for me. Panic seized me as I grabbed Eliza's hand, dragging her toward the door, we have to go, I shouted, my voice frantic. Now, but before we could take another step, the front door was suddenly kicked open, and I stumbled back in shock. Greg stood in the doorway, his face twisted into a mask of rage and madness. He held a knife in his hand, its blade glinting in the dim light, still wet with Rachel's blood, Eliza screamed, but the sound barely registered in my ears. All I could focus on was Greg, his wild eyes, the way his chest heaved with fury, the way his grip tightened on the knife as he took a step toward us, you ruined everything, Greg spat, his voice low and venomous. You think you can play with people's lives and just walk away? You think you can have my wife and get away with it? I backed up, pulling Eliza with me, my mind a frantic blur. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. The walls were closing in, and the man I had pushed to the edge was standing right in front of me, ready to finish what he had started, Greg, please, I stammered, holding up my hands in a futile attempt to calm him. We can talk about this. It doesn't have to end this way but he only sneered, his grip on the knife tightening as he took another step closer. You should have thought of that before you started this game in that moment, I realized there was no talking him down, no reasoning with the monster I had unleashed. Greg was here for blood, and nothing was going to stop him, with a sudden burst of adrenaline, I pushed Eliza behind me, my eyes locking onto Greg's. Eliza, run, I shouted, my voice breaking with desperation. Go, but before she could move, Greg lunged at me, the knife flashing in the air. I barely had time to react, throwing up my arms in a desperate attempt to fend him off. The blade sliced through my forearm, a searing pain shooting up my arm as blood poured from the wound that I stumbled back, clutching my arm, the pain nearly blinding me. Greg advanced on me, his face twisted in a sick grin, ready to strike again. But just as he raised the knife, Eliza screamed and grabbed a lamp from the table, swinging it with all her might, the lamp shattered against Greg's head, and he staggered back, dazed. It wasn't enough to knock him out, but it gave me the opening I needed. With a surge of adrenaline, I tackled him to the ground, wrestling the knife from his grip. We struggled, rolling across the floor, but I was fueled by fear and desperation. I couldn't let him win. I couldn't let him kill me, finally, I managed to wrench the knife from his hand, and without thinking, I drove it into his side. Greg gasped, his eyes widening in shock as blood spilled from the wound. I pulled the knife out and stabbed him again, and again, each thrust filled with the terror of a man fighting for his life, when it was over, I was left kneeling on the floor, 
Greg's blood covering my hands, my chest heaving with ragged breaths. His body lay still, lifeless, the rage finally extinguished, Eliza was standing in the corner, her face pale, her eyes wide with shock. She didn't move, didn't speak, just stared at me as if she didn't recognize the man kneeling before her that I dropped the knife, the sound of it hitting the floor ringing in my ears. The adrenaline drained from my body, leaving me weak and trembling. I had one, but at what cost? Rachel was dead, Greg was dead, and I was the one holding the knife, Eliza, I whispered, but I couldn't find the words. What could I possibly say to her? How could I explain this, make her understand, but I didn't have to? The sound of sirens filled the night air, growing louder with each passing second. Someone had called the police, maybe a neighbor who had heard the commotion, maybe a passerby. It didn't matter, they were coming for me, Eliza finally moved, stepping forward as if in a daze. She reached out to touch my arm, but I flinched away, unable to bear her touch, I'm sorry, I whispered, tears streaming down my face. I'm so sorry, but it was too late. The door burst open, and the police flooded in, their guns drawn, shouting commands I barely registered. I didn't resist as they pulled me to my feet, cuffing my hands behind my back. The reality of what I had done, of the destruction I had caused, crashed over me like a tidal wave. As they led me away, I looked back at Eliza one last time. She stood there, frozen in place, tears streaming down her face. The love and trust that had once defined our relationship were gone, replaced by something darker, something I had created, the last thing I saw before they pushed me into the squad car was the shattered remains of my life, strewn across the blood-soaked floor the game was over, and I had lost everything.